Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Davide. I'm a production engineer at Meta, and we'll be talking about building the future with CentOS Stream. Uh, here's the agenda for today. We'll start uh, with a quick historical introduction of how we've been using CentOS of Meta and how that changed throughout the years. We'll talk specifically about contributing upstream and the work we've been doing in the space. We'll then deep dive into the Hyperscale SIG, uh, which is one of the most recent efforts we had in terms of contributing upstream within the CentOS project. And we close with a few words on how you two can get involved. So let's get started. Um, as I said, I'm a production engineer. I work on the Linux team uh, right now, uh, which is responsible for the, mm, all the components of the Linux ecosystem that run in production at Facebook. So uh, the Linux distribution, but also systemd and the components of the user space and the kernel and all of that. Before that, I was on the operating systems team, uh, which took care of uh, the deployment and maintenance of the distribution in production and the, the platform that all the other services at Facebook were running on. I'm going to say Facebook and Meta interchangeably because I'm still not used to the name, sorry. Um, so Meta has a lot of machines. Uh, we have millions of servers spread across the globe in several data centers. All of these, and all of these are physical servers to be clear. Um, we, don't, we don't really use VMs uh, for production. All of these servers run CentOS, all of these servers run Linux. Uh, and I've been running CentOS since the beginning, um, or at least since as far as I've been at the company. I started in 2012. Um, so before we talk about how we use CentOS, I want to spend a few moments talking about why we use CentOS. Uh, CentOS has a lot of very desirable properties in a Linux distribution for a production environment that you may want to run. First of all, CentOS gives you stable releases, and stable releases are excellent checkpoints uh, because we can, you can use them as synchronization points in time whenever you want to apply other changes. Uh, and I will talk about that a bit more in, in a minute. Uh, critically, CentOS gives you binary compatibility. And that is a feature that is not quite as common in Linux distributions these days, but it is extremely valuable when you're doing deployments at scale. Binary compatibility means that at any given point in time, I can update packages on a production system, and whatever is running on the machine will keep running, because the updates within a given uh, release of the distribution, so within, like, say, CentOS 8 or CentOS 7, they, will, they have ABI and API compatibility. So I can update libraries under the hood and while a package is running, and the package will keep running. And like this, this works like 98% of the time, because sometimes people screw up, but for the vast majority of time it works. And it means we can effectively apply uh, security updates and any kinds of updates in production on the fleet in a mostly unattended fashion and expect them to just work. Speaking of updates, of course, we have security updates, which are valuable uh, because we like security. Uh, because CentOS is part of the Red Hat ecosystem, which has been around for a while in this space, it has a lot of very mature and well-understood tooling. Uh, at this point, we understand very well how to work with things like RPM, uh, with the packaging stack, with all the tooling that are specific to this infrastructure, um, which is also very easy to build on top of it. Also, because it's part of this family, it can also leverage the extended, the extended Red Hat family. So we can leverage content from Appel, uh, which are the extra packages for enterprise Linux, and we can leverage the fact that CentOS is built from Fedora uh, and, and make changes into Fedora and see them then trickle down to CentOS. And we will talk about this specifically in a bit more. Um, so over the years um, at Facebook uh, and at any other environment, really, if you maintain a complex production infrastructure for a while, you will notice that you, would, you run like 80-90% of stuff as it comes from upstream, but then there's some things that you need to make changes of, be it because you need to update a package internally or you have internal packages you have to add, or you have missing dependencies and all of that. So the way we handled that um, up to a few years ago was that we would keep internal backports of packages that we cared about that were tracking upstream more closely. So we have packages like systemd where we do a lot of development upstream, and we would want to follow the upstream development closely instead of being pinned to the stable releases that CentOS provided us. So we take these backports from Fedora Rawhide, which is the development version um, of Fedora, and we maintain those internally and then later we realized that there wasn't really much of a point of keeping this internal only, so we put this on a GitHub repo, which was that repo. Um, and we wrote this in a way that we gated the Facebook-specific changes under a macro, so that if you, too, wanted to build these packages, you could use them and run them in your infrastructure, and you wouldn't get, like, our NTP servers and stuff. Uh, we call this internally FTL, a fast thin layer, and this gave us the ability to effectively have a distribution that was stable, but it was also moving as quickly as we wanted. Uh, and we mostly applied this approach to lower level packaging in the distribution. So as I mentioned, things like systemd, things like the, the user space, the user space plumbing. Um, the other thing that we did is that we do not run the stock CentOS kernel. Uh, we never really did. Uh, we've always ran our own kernel build 
primarily because we have we have a lot of kernel developers who do a lot of kernel development in house at Meta, um, and it is a lot easier to just run the upstream kernel um, because that's where the development is going to happen anyway. That's where the changes are going to be merged, rather than running uh, a vendor kernel that has a lot of backboards that then you have to maintain and ends up being a very different beast. We also make a number of policy changes on the kernel side where compared to the distribution, we run, for example, with Serve 2 by default. Uh, we use ButterFS extensively in Meta, uh, and ButterFS has been the root file system for the entire fleet um, as of CentOS 8. Yeah, it was with CentOS 8 that we flipped it. Uh, but we've been using it even before when, when, we are, when we were at the fleet, mostly on Sun 7. Um, uh, so this is an example of, a, of what we call a policy deviation. So it's something that we, may, we consciously make a choice to put something in production that is different from what the distribution itself is doing. Other examples are for IP tables. Um, for a variety of reasons, we don't, we don't use NF tables in production and meta. We want to still use the legacy IP tables backend. So we rebuild the IP tables packages with that backend enabled. On the networking side, upstream CentOS has been using Network Manager for a long time. Uh, we don't really use Network Manager in production. Uh, historically, we've been using Network Scripts since Cent5 and earlier, uh, and that's what we kept running until effectively today. Right now, we're in the process of moving from Network Scripts to SystemD NetworkD. Um, that is what I expect we will deploy uh, fleet-wide with CentOS 9, and we're in the process of refactoring it uh, and rolling it out to a portion of the CentOS 8 fleet as well. Uh, now let's talk about upgrade. Um, as I mentioned, I've been at, at Meta since 2012. Uh, when I joined in 2012, we were running CentOS Linux 5. Uh, we didn't really have a process at the time for doing OS upgrades, uh, so we kind of stumbled through it and managed to eventually update the fleet to CentOS Linux 8, and that took a while. Uh, uh, CentOS Linux 6, and that took a while. When we did 6 to 7, that was a big transition, because 6 to 7, if you remember, was the one where SystemD was introduced. Uh, and that meant having to convert all of the services we had internally, where at the time we had uh, like five or six different init supervision systems for services, and having those come, yes, Neil. The, I have another talk on that if you want, but it's not this talk. Um, it, and, and it was converting all of these onto SystemD because it was, it was a great opportunity to get rid of a lot of uh, technical depth and craft and just use a unified system. Um, that was also the first time when we started actually actively engaging, I would say, with upstream and trying to work with folks. We worked with folks uh, on Anaconda, for example. At the time, we were using Anaconda as a system installer. Uh, we started engaging directly with the SystemD project and contributed a number of changes that were informed by our production deployment. Uh, more recently, we've been migrating the fleet from CentOS, 7 to CentOS, 3, CentOS Linux 7 to CentOS Stream 8. And right now, we are in the process of starting the 8 to 9 migration. We just finished quali qualifying CentOS Stream 9 in the past few months, uh, and we've kick-started the mass migration earlier this month. I expect that we'll take the better part of this year and the next. Um, these things usually always take a while. The reason these things usually take a while is because when we do major OS upgrades, we do a full reprovisioning of the system. So we wipe the machine, and we re-image it from scratch as if it were a new machine. Uh, there's a few reasons why we do this. Um, so first of all, technically, in-place upgrades aren't supported for CentOS. Uh, there are ways to do in-place upgrades with CentOS, and if you, if you actually try it, it will mostly work in the vast majority of cases. There's also tools that you can use to make this work better. There's the Elevate tool that the Alma Linux folks have. There's the Leap um, tool set that Red Hat maintains. Um, However, we don't really want to do in-place upgrades, uh, because when you do an in-place upgrade, it means you're carrying back all of the stuff you had previously on the system. Uh, and uh, it is a rare opportunity where you can have a clean slate, and you can choose to actively deprecate things and switch to new things at the same time. So we generally treat the OS upgrades as synchronization points where we can also couple a number of other things with the upgrade itself. So usually we will switch the default kernel to a more modern kernel that has features we care about. And because updating the kernel implies a reboot, well, you're rebooting anyway already if you're re-imaging the machine, so you might as well do that. Uh, we've used this when we switched the root file system to ButterFS, because um, you were going to re-image the machines anyway. Uh, we've used this in the past to also deprecate various things, various internal services, because um, at the time it, 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 was a good, it was a good opportunity. And because this leverages the general maintenance windows we have, it can leverage all the existing automation. Uh, the way we do this in practice is that uh, service owners 
Um, oh, and to be clear, at, at Meta, the general understanding is that if you run services in production, you own the machines that you're running the services on production, and you're responsible. You're generally responsible for doing these migrations yourself. We will provide you the tooling, and we will give you deadlines, but the actual mechanics of the migration are, are going to be up to you. Um, and uh, what, what people have been doing in the past, this was a fairly manual process, but as of sent, half of sent 7 and beginning of sent 8, we had really good tooling for doing this in an automated fashion. So people can effectively say, I can lose these many machines at this rate with these physical constraints, fire, and then they'll start, and the automation starts churning through machines, takes them offline, reprovisions them, puts them back online, checks that they're healthy, puts them back in production, and so on. So it's a, it's a fairly hands-off approach, as long as there aren't any regression or any issues, of course. Um, and we've been fine-tuning this tooling. This tooling is unfortunately very tightly coupled with our infrastructure, um, but you could build something like that out of open source tooling. There's nothing particularly earth shattering in it. Now, we don't do reprovisioning for everything. Uh, we only do that for major OS upgrades. Uh, for minor OS upgrades, we just do incremental updates by effectively running DNF upgrade like you would expect. Um, we snapshot the YAM repositories, so we always have a stable point in time that we can reference. We do snapshots every two weeks of all the repositories upstream. Uh, we, mm, we started doing this process before composes of the distributions were a public thing. Uh, nowadays, if you were to implement this from scratch, you would probably just want to use the CentOS composes that they publish. And if you're not familiar, a compose is a... Uh, basically, the distribution is put together and packed in a compose, and it's an installable set of the entire distribution. And they publish these um, between every few days and every few weeks, depending on the development cycle upstream. Um, so that's a good synchronization point if you're building something like that. In our case, we just take snapshots of the live repos every two weeks, then we roll them out of the fleet across two weeks. We do the actual rollout using Chef, which is our configuration management system. So Chef has some logic in, a, in, a, in the cookbook that manages DNF and YAM. It has logic to figure out, OK, I am on version X. We're moving to version X plus one. Update the repo definition, run the DNF update, check that it's fine. Um, of course, we have ways to monitor that this is going well. We have ways to stop it. Uh, we generally start the rollout on a very small portion of the fleet and can it up. But because of that binary compatibility guarantee I mentioned before, this is more or less a hands-off approach. Generally, whenever we do this, we will spend a day or so at the beginning to check for conflicts, check for issues. Oftentimes, the issue you end up is because of some internal packages that has messed up RPM dependencies that we have to fix. Uh, the upstream stuff usually works just fine. And then you apply it, and you roll it on, and you move on. Um, now, we should talk about containers as well. Uh, all, all, everything I said so far has been about bare metal. Uh, the reality is that these days, a lot of production workloads don't run on the bare metal directly. They run on the container platform, which itself runs on bare metal. The container platforms and meta it's called Tupperware. It's an internally developed platform. It start, the development started long before containers were, were a thing, or at least a widely used thing. Uh, but they use all of the traditional container technologies you might expect. So C groups, namespaces. Um, we use, uh, we're increasingly using more and more features from systemd for the container management itself. And in fact, the container agent that we run on the host is primarily based on systemd nowadays. Um, while Tupperware itself is not open source, a lot of the components uh, are slowly being rebuilt on top of open source tools, and as part of this process, we're improving the corresponding tools. The containers themselves also run CentOS. In fact, they run the same CentOS that we use for the bare metal hosts. Um, we build the container images from the same repositories we use to build the production, the production systems. Uh, we have an internal tool for building container images called Antlier, um, but it's like about the same as any other container image build tool that you might expect. Uh, the good thing and bad thing about containers is that because they're decoupled from the host, the update cycle doesn't have to be in sync with the host. So you often end up with having, say, CentOS 7 containers running on CentOS 8 hosts and vice versa. This is good and bad in that it makes updates easier because you can carry on all their living containers. It's also bad because you oftentimes end up with stragglers, and sometimes it does matter. Uh, the difference does matter if you're, for example, transferring data back and forth. Um, and in the case of containers, obviously, we don't do in-place updates because they are containers. It's a lot easier to just tear it down and bring it back up with a new image. Okay, so what I talked about so far is roughly what we had been doing um, up to like 20, 2016, 2017. Um, over the years, this approach worked, but we definitely found that there were, there were kinks, there were issues. It was, it was tricky at times to do this nicely. Um, for, the, for FTL specifically, because we were maintaining these many backports internally, 
Every time you backport something and you maintain it yourself, you're effectively forking it. If you fork something, you have to maintain it forever, or at least throughout the lifetime. Uh, and because these are forks, you don't really have a good solution to upstreaming the changes you're making. Well, you can send PRs, of course, um, but it wasn't really clear. And what we would end up doing is that things would diverge quite a bit, especially for leaf packages that people may not necessarily follow super closely. Oftentimes, what you see is that someone backports some random library because they need it for their tool, but they don't actually care about the library. So they'll just backport it once, and then there's 25 CVEs on it. And I was like, cool, now we need to fix that. Um, also, we were putting these on GitHub, but like, there were just a bunch of spec files on GitHub. I, think, I know a few people were using especially the systemd backport, but they weren't super usable. And at the same time, as I mentioned, whenever things were fixed upstream, we would have to manually integrate those, and we will also have to manually integrate whenever the distro would update, or, or pin our version so they wouldn't get shadowed. Uh, same, same thing on the policy side. Whenever we made that decision to change something, we then had to deal with the consequences. And the main issue here is that whenever you deviate strongly from something the distribution is making, you run to the risk of not being able to effectively report bugs in a useful way, because the bugs you might end up encountering that might be specific to your setup, and they might not apply to the distribution. So you end up having to double repro everything. And we also didn't really have a feedback loop on whether the choices we were making were useful or were things that others could benefit from. So now let's talk about how we can do better and how we can do better by engaging more closely with upstream. Um, I don't think I need to explain to this crowd the benefits of working with upstream, but I'll do it anyway um, for the benefit of the wider audience. Um, the main thing we've discovered over the years, well, discovered. Um, I don't think this is particularly a discovery, but the, the, the thing that I think is important to realize is that whenever you're working with projects that have a well-established and wide community, you are not going to be the one that is doing the, the impactful work most of the time. You're not going to be the one that is setting the direction. The, the community is, the, is where the work is going to happen. Um, it's, it's easy oftentimes, especially if you come from a large company, to, to think of everything you're doing as awesome and everything you're doing as the cutting edge. But the reality is that for a lot of the project, the cutting edge is what is happening outside. And if you want to be a part of that, you have to work with the people that are doing this on their ground, work with the project and make things better. Also, in, for something, if you think about something like a Linux distribution, there's going to be a subset of it that you really care about, that you want to follow very closely. But there's also going to be a lot of things that you might tangentially use, but that you really don't want to maintain yourself. You don't have the expertise. You don't care. Um, think about, for example, if you run parts of LibreOffice for doing some production workload. Do you really want to maintain that in-house? Unless you're an expert of it and that's part of your core business. Um, the benefit of being able to do this work upstream is that you can leverage what the community is doing. You don't have to do everything yourself, and whenever you fix something, others can benefit from it, and vice versa. At the same time, whenever you write something new, and if you, if you make an effort to open source it at the beginning, then everybody else can contribute and give you feedback. Uh, over the years, we found that by far the best way to do this is by just showing up to the community. If you show up to the community where people are doing actual work and engage with them as a peer, go there, solve real problems, real engineering problems, that's how you generally do work in this space. That's how you, do sp that's how you become a real member of the community. That's how you can build trust with the community and gain a better understanding of what's going on. So let's talk about specifically CentOS for now. And to talk about CentOS, uh, we need to take a bit of a history detour and look into the sausage making machine of how CentOS was created over the years. Um, so there's various players to these games. There's CentOS, there's Fedora, and there's Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, and to be clear, I don't work at Red Hat. I've never worked at Red Hat. This is my personal understanding of how this is. Uh, so Fedora is the community distribution that is maintained by Red Hat that tends to be close to the cutting edge. It's what you might be running on your laptop right now. Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the product that Red Hat, the company, sells, uh, which is an enterprise Linux distribution. And CentOS, historically, was a rebuild of Red Hat Enterprise Linux from sources. So the development process roughly went like this. They would take the version of Fedora at the time, which in the case of CentOS Linux 7 was Fedora 19. That was a while ago. Internally, at the beginning of the development cycle for RHEL, they would take Fedora 19 and snapshot it. And this would get snapshotted into an internal staging distribution that Red Hat would maintain, kind of like a primordial soup that they would use to slowly stabilize the distro and turn it into a commercial product. When this was ready, they would release Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and together with it, they would release the sources. Then a different group would take the sources, rebuild, rebuild them from scratch, 
uh, without using any of the existing infrastructure and release CentOS Linux as the, as the product there. Um, so if, you, if you're us and you're running CentOS Linux in production, you would then take CentOS Linux and deploy it. Now let's say you're running, you're running CentOS Linux 7 in production and you find a bug and you really want to fix it. Uh, you fix it internally, but you would like the fix to go upstream so you don't have to keep maintaining it forever. What can you do about it? So your options are kind of limited in this world. You can't really contribute to CentOS because CentOS is just a rebuild of RHEL. There's no, the, the only real meat in there is the, the build and the, the build process that's rebuild the distribution. There's not really anything else. So you can't make any changes there. You can't really contribute to RHEL. RHEL for starters, RHEL is a product. Even if you are a customer of Red Hat, they didn't really have a way to send PRs. Uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't a development process. There wasn't a Gitforge or anything. You could file issues on Bugzilla, and maybe they will look at it, maybe not. Maybe they will take the patches, but your options were kind of limited there. And even if you did get your patch included, it would be included into the next minor release, which might not be coming for a while. You obviously can't do anything about the staging distribution because it's internal to Red Hat. The one thing you could contribute is Fedora. Uh, and while you could absolutely do that, uh, if you manage to get your changes landed in Fedora, they would only impact the next major release of RHEL and CentOS, which would be years off. Um, so you were kind of stuck. You effectively had to maintain a lot of stuff internally. With 8, things changed a little bit. Um, with 8, the process was similar. They started from Fedora 28. They branched it into an internal distribution, which I didn't put in the slides because it didn't fit. Um, but then when they released Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, they also released something new called CentOS Stream 8. And the idea is that CentOS Stream 8 is a continuously delivered distribution that is developed in the open. And that's, that's where changes land first. And, that's, and then changes from there will land into the next minor release of RHEL. So it is effectively the distribution that Red Hat used to have internally for developing the next minor release of RHEL before it went out. Uh, if you're running CentOS of RHEL, uh, you, you probably remember that you had, you had like a base repository and then you had an updates repository that was getting a trickle of updates. That's where those updates would come from, effectively. In, with 8, these updates just show up in CentOS stream after they they're went past the CICD pipeline and everything. Um, and, but the new thing here is that all of, the, all of the sources for stream were easily accessible in one place, and there was a contribution process. So you could actually send PRs, you could send bug reports, you could get this merged. You could apply changes to the distribution, and they would land, and they would land in the next compose. So if you found a bug in like some fringe package, I don't know, Nmap or something, you could send the you could send the fix upstream, and if the fix was deemed acceptable, because obviously this is like any other project, they can choose to take or not take your contributions. But if the fix was deemed acceptable, it would get merged, and then you could just deploy it. Um, and this massively reduces the burden of having to maintain things internally because you don't have to; you can just get them up. With nine, uh, which is where we are now, things are have changed even changed even more. So with nine, nine we started from Fedora 34, uh, which is not that long ago actually. Um, and in addition to releasing CentOS Stream nine, there is also a new distribution in the middle, which is called Fedora ELN. And Fedora ELN is effectively the staging distribution that I was mentioning earlier, but public. Not only but public, but continuously updated at any point in time. So the idea with ELN is, if, is what if we took the development version of Fedora today and made RHEL out of it, with it every day? And it is something that exists that you can install today and that gives you a window into effectively what the next major version will be. Then, of course, you have CentOS Stream. And the other change with 9 is that they dropped the CentOS Linux rebuild. Um, so the only, the only deliverable that comes out of the CentOS, uh, the CentOS project itself is CentOS Stream nowadays. So to recap, um, there are many avenues that you can use to contribute in this ecosystem if you want to be involved. Uh, you can work at the, at the layer of Fedora. Fedora is what influences the, what goes into the next CentOS 3 major release. It is a great place. If there are new technologies that you would like to see adopted, is there's, if there are things that you are developing on, especially if there are things that are relevant to the whole ecosystem, it is a great place to do this work. It's also a great place to maintain packages. If your company or your, or your environment has open source software that they care about, making sure that the software is packaged and maintained in Fedora is a great way to gain user adoption. 
Um, one thing I wanted to stress in particular is the change proposal process, uh, because I think it's, it's a very good process for managing change at scale into the distribution. And in the case of Fedora, the way this works is that whenever anyone wants to, do, to change something notable in the distribution, they can put together a proposal. They, they have to do the actual work, obviously. Um, but then if the proposal is approved, the changes, the changes are implemented in the distribution and become available to everyone in the next release. Uh, and over the year, we've leveraged this process quite a bit, and there are several changes that we landed in Fedora. Uh, to be clear, this isn't just work that Meta did. All of these things had major contributions from the community, both from other companies and our community partner that helped us. Uh, for Fedora 33, we landed ButterFS support by default, um, and as of Fedora 33, Fedora ships with ButterFS by default as the root file system. With 34, we ship ButterFS with the standard compression by default, um, which made it more efficient on solid state drives and other environments. With Fedora 34, we also shipped systemd umd by default. Systemd umd is a user space out of memory implementation that uh, it leverages some new kernel features that can more or less predict the future and figure out when your system is about to go out of memory, but before it actually goes out of memory so that the applications can react before the um killer, the kernel um killer is unleashed. This is something that was developed at Meta within systemd, upstream to systemd, and then uh, deployed to Fedora. With 35, we switched ButterFS by default also for the Fedora cloud images. Um, with 36, we moved the RPN database to user, which helps for some snapshotting use cases. For 37, right now, we have a few changes in the works and for future releases. I'm not going to read all of the slides. If you're interested, you're welcome to ask me questions, and I'm happy to go in details. Um, if any of this sounds interesting, uh, you're also welcome to help out, obviously. Uh, we can always use more help. And if you too would like to make changes in Fedora, this is, this is how you too can do it. Now let's talk about Appel. I mentioned Appel briefly at the beginning. Um, so Fedora releases packages for its own distribution, which is Fedora. But a lot of these packages are useful also in other environments. Uh, with Appel, a subset of Fedora is rebuilt and targeted for enterprise Linux. Um, so the, the packages can be used on RHEL and on CentOS Stream. We, we use this a lot. Um, because the set of the base packages for, of CentOS is pretty small. There's a ton of other packages you may want to use in production. You really don't want to maintain them internally, so being able to leverage the packaging that is done in Fedora is incredibly useful. Um, in more recent years, there's been, a, there's been an effort to try to make this process more streamlined. Historically, whether a package was branched or not for Appel was really up to the maintainer of the package, which was generally a single individual human that may or may not care about it. And these days, we try to set up a process so that packages can have more of a collective maintenance if needed, so we can share the burden. A lot of the time, packaging something for Appel isn't terribly challenging, but it's also not terribly interesting. You're basically like merging all the changes from the other branch, doing the build, checking that the build works, cool. That there's rarely any challenging, challenging work to do there. So it makes sense to have more of a streamlined approach to these. We also did a lot of work on tooling. Um, one of my colleagues, Michelle, is working on a tool to automate the process of branching packages so that it will be easier to add them in the future. And we set up a special interest group um, to generally manage uh, the collective maintenance of Appel more easily. Um, I mentioned ELN earlier, earlier as well. ELN, as we've said, is a continuous rebuild of Fedora Rawhide, but using the CentOS macros and the CentOS toolchain. So the end result that you get out of it is effectively CentOS, but if it were built against today's sources of Fedora. This gives you a window in what the next CentOS version could be. So if you, if you look at ELN today, ELN is what will CentOS 10 build be in a year, a year and change when CentOS 10 will be branched and come out. Uh, there's a special interest group for ELN as well um, that we've been engaged. Um, most of the work there has been around making ELN easier to consume. Uh, ELN produces installer images, it produces a set of repos. Uh, and also how, how we could extend this to more than just the basic distribution. Um, one idea that we had early on was that we could use this to also make life easier for Appel, because if, you, well, if you're testing packages for the new version of Stream, you might as well test the, the set of packages that are also going to be ranked for Appel while you're at it. Um, so this is covered by something called the LN Extras, um, which is effectively a set of additional packages that wouldn't be part of the distribution itself, but are still tested and composed together with it. And Meta, uh, we are using this in a variety of ways. For starters, there's a number of open source projects we maintain that we want to make sure keep working, um, keep working in Fedora and in CentOS and stay packaged properly. We, we do this by having a CI CD pipelines in these projects upstream, the leverage packet, and packet delivers us 
RPM builds for various shows, and one of these shows environments is Fedora ELN. And not only delivers us this build, but delivers us nicely formatted repos. So if you want to test today's build of, say, the, the, you know, the, the below resource control system, resource control uh, daemon with, um, with Fedora ELN or whatever, you can just get the packages from there. Um, this is done through a system called, this is done through a system called Packet. Uh, the other thing we do is that for packages that are, uh, as I mentioned before, in Appel that we want to track, we have a workload in um, content resolution so that they're branched for ELN extras. Uh, these are either packages we maintain or packages that somebody else maintains but that we want to track closely. Internally, we're also in the early stages of establishing a CI-CD pipeline using ELN. The idea is that whenever we do a new CentOS major release qualification, there's a period of several months that we have to take to do qualification. And it'd be real nice if we could spread that instead across. And if we had a way to deploy ELN to the fleet and run a production workload on it throughout its life, we could spot issues very early on and either work on them internally if they turn out to be issues on our side, or work with upstream to see if we can maybe make things easier and better for everyone. Uh, moving on to CentOS, uh, CentOS Stream, as I said, is a continuously delivered distribution that tracks the next minor release of RHEL. So if right now we're at RHEL 8.34, I don't actually know, this will track RHEL 8.5 or X plus one. Um, you can file bugs for CentOS Stream that way. The reason I put that on the slides is because I find it entirely non-obvious uh, because you have to actually file the bugs for RHEL but putting CentOS Stream as the version. The, all the sources for CentOS Stream are on git.centos.org, and by sources here I mean all of the package specs. Um, the, the way the CentOS community is governed is via special interest groups, and SIGs are really the building blocks of the community, and that's where all of the interesting work and development work happens. And I will talk about SIGs a bit more in a second. For Stream 9, it's more or less the same. As you can see, these slides are pretty similar, except the sources nowadays are, have moved to GitLab, so if you go on GitLab.com, write a CentOS stream, and you can use the GitLab MR workflow, um, which you might find a little bit easier than the previous one. Uh, the builds are on Koji in the same way. There's a different Koji for reasons for nine, but it, it, doesn't really, it doesn't really make a practical difference. And that's the link where you can find the daily composes if you would like to try them out. Uh, we use this process uh, I mentioned before that there, the, there's now a process for doing contributions to stream, and we actually leverage this quite a bit for the nine develop cycle. Uh, because of this, we were able to land a variety of changes into CentOS 9 long before RHEL 9 actually came out. So these were all changes that were landed in CentOS 9 between the time it branched and the time RHEL 9 was out. Um, this, uh, this was great, frankly, because these are all things that we would have had otherwise to do ourselves. Uh, that maybe would have taken months to years to get into the distribution proper, and this way they were just there. And we plan to continue doing this in the future. Uh, to be clear, again, this is not just work that we at Meta did. This, is, this was the result of cooperation between us and members from the community like Neil, who is smiling on the second row, um, that helped us a lot through this process. Now let's talk about SIGs, and specifically about Hyperscale. Uh, the Hyperscale SIG, is a special interest group that we founded in January of last year. Um, the idea behind Hyperscale is to have a place for companies and engineers that want to work on large-scale infrastructure to work together. It focuses entirely on CentOS Stream, uh, and in general, uh, what we want to do is to have a place where all of these companies that do tooling development and deployments in-house, they might end up kind of reinventing the wheel themselves all the time. We want them to cooperate on this together in a place that is in the open. So bringing all this in-house development out so that folks can work. Uh, this has folks from Meta, from Twitter, from Dado, from a variety of other companies, uh, oh, Intel as well now. Um, and, but this, you don't have to be in a, in a company or in a, in a company of any kind or in a large company to be a part of this. You can, you can also just be interested. And while this nominally targets large-scale deployments, the reality is that a lot of the work we're doing here is hopefully also useful to smaller-scale deployments. Um, there's a few links there uh, on the, the splash page of the SIG and our user documentation. We hang out on IRC, on Libera, and the room is bridged on Matrix. Most of us are in US Pacific time, but there's usually someone around all the time, so you're welcome to join and ask questions if you would like. 
primarily, we, uh, we, do, we do a few things here, uh, and I'm going to try to go over quickly the main things we have. The main, the main deliverable of the SIG right now is uh, what we call faster moving package backports. So I mentioned earlier this FTL thing we used to do internally at Meta. This is effectively the same, but done properly and done in the open in a way that other folks can contribute to. So we deliver updated backports of distribution packages, either with new features enabled or that follow upstream more closely. And the idea is that if you're running CentOS Stream 8 or CentOS Stream 9 and you would like a more updated version of a package, you can install the version that we provide in hyperscale and the distribution will keep working just the same as before, just better. Uh, this targets stable and production use, and these are the same package that we are running at Meta in production. If you have a CentOS system right now, you can get this by doing DNF install CentOS release hyperscale, which will enable our repos. And then if you do DNF update, this will update all of your packages to ours. If you don't want that to happen, you can use version lock or other solutions to pick and choose what you want. There's a lot of packages in here. I will not read through the list, but you can pull up the CBS tag to see it. CBS is the community build system, is where builds for packages that special interest groups work on happen. Most of these is um, what we call like low level system user space or Linux user space. So things like Util Linux and Raycat, packages that um, allow you to do either hardware enablement or enablement for new features or support for newer kernels and things like that. I want to talk specifically about systemd because I think it's a great example um, we've been maintaining a systemd backport for several years at this point that was tracking the latest production, stable release of systemd. This is what we've been running in production at, at Facebook or at Meta uh, for years, and it is based, as I mentioned before, on the Fedora Ride packaging. You can see this, this on, on, the, on Git Santos. You can see the spec files for this. Uh, we maintain this in its own Git repo as well on Pagure, so it's easier to track patches and to see, to see what changes have been made. Uh, but mostly these tend to be like verbatim imports of upstream releases with okay, the occasional bug fix on. Uh, we also have a CI CD pipeline where every day we take the latest Git master of systemd and we build it against our packaging and publish it. Uh, this makes it really easy to spot regressions in the build system. It also makes it easy if you want to test a one-off feature that was just merged into systemd and see how that's working out for you. You can just grab these packages and install them. Um, this uses the CentOS OpenShift CI environment. One of the things that CentOS provides special interest groups is access to an OpenShift environment where you can run effectively arbitrary container jobs. This is great, and it's made our life very, very easier, very much easier than having to re-implement this in-house before. The other, se the other set of changes that we do, as I mentioned, is uh, what we call policy, policy changes and configuration alternatives. And the idea here is that we will release packages that have different defaults, but should still be usable and uh, should still not apply negative changes to the distribution. So the traditional example here is IP tables, where we, we ship a modified IP tables package that also has the legacy backend enabled. So if you don't want to use NF tables, you can use that. Um, now, everything I mentioned so far are things you would want to run in production, and you should be able to run on your production machines without any issues. The other set of things we work on are experimental changes. Things you may want to run on your production machines, but you don't necessarily want to deploy everywhere. Um, a lot of the time when you're doing development of distro-wide features, it is really useful to be able to test those and deploy those in production. But it's often not just a matter of building one package. It tends to be a set of interconnected changes. So a good example here is the work we've been doing for a while on uh, DNF and RPM copy on write. Uh, that's its own talk altogether, but the short version of this is that it's a set of changes to the RPM packaging stack that allows it to leverage the copy on write features that modern file systems like ButterFS provide to make package installation a lot more efficient. Uh, this requires changes to RPM, DNF, the entirety of the stack. Th this is something we run in production at Facebook now, but it's something you may not want to run on your environment until it's stabilized a little bit more. Um, it's also not in Fedora yet. We, we have been working on a change proposal to get it in Fedora. Um, but if you want to try this, it is also available in Hyperscale. You can install our experimental repo, and that will give you access to this set of packages that you can deploy in production and use, or in your test environment if you prefer. In the same repo, you will also find our kernel. Uh, for several months now, we have been building 5.14 based kernels as part of Hyperscale. We use 5.14 because 5.14 is the kernel that's shipped in CentOS Stream 9, so we can have the same version on both 8 and 9. 
This is effectively the same kernel that shipped in 9, but it has a number of extra features enabled, notably ButterFS. So you can use CentOS with ButterFS and inst even install a system from scratch on a ButterFS file system. Uh, to be clear, this is not the kernel we run in production at Meta. It is a kernel that is based on some of these things. Uh, longer term, I would like to see kind of a closer, uh, some bringing this closer to the kernel we run internally and vice versa, but we're not quite there yet. In addition to the kernel, we also maintain what we call the kernel user space, so packages that are tightly coupled with the kernel that you may want to update at the same time. So things like ButterFS props and comp size, which are ButterFS specific tools, is still uh, which uh, is often something you want to update for hardware support, and kpatch, um, which is used for the kernel life patching environment. We have a lot of other things we're doing in Hyperscale, and I uh, did not put a full list here. A couple of notable things I wanted to mention is that we have container images, so if you want to play these uh, very quickly in your container environments, you can pull the images. These are minimal container images that were built from scratch using Builder. They're not based on the official CentOS images, um, the reason being because the official CentOS images are based on UBI and that carried a bunch of baggage we didn't really want to deal with here. Um, also, you can use the build scripts if you would like uh, to build this on your own. Uh, there is like a 20 line bash script, so it's nothing particularly fancy. We've also started maintaining live media spins. Um, so, if you've installed CentOS recently, when you install CentOS from the DVD, it boots into Anaconda and you install Anaconda, but you don't have a live system. If you install Fedora, you get a nice live desktop and everything. The idea is to have spins, installer spins that look like the Fedora ones, where you have a live desktop so you can try the system and play with it with all of our features baked in into enabled. So you boot into a system that has our systemd, it has support for ButterFS, it has up-to-date packages, so you can both use them if you need to say rest your live system, but you can also install this since the beginning with ButterFS and all of that. Uh, right now, this is only released for CentOS 3.8 um, because we haven't updated the build system yet, but we are in the process of getting this out for 9 as well. Um, there's many things we would like to do that we haven't started yet. Um, cloud images is the first one, a way to leverage transactional updates with ButterFS, uh, better testing infrastructure so that we can have automated notifications whenever there are issues with all these packages. If any of this sounds interesting, if you would like to help, uh, if any of this sounds fun, please reach out. Uh, we can definitely use more people. Uh, if you deploy this into your infrastructure, I would also love to hear. Uh, it's always great to hear user stories and what people are doing with the things we build. Now, as I mentioned, uh, I promise you a few pointers on how you two can get involved. Uh, all of these communities are very easy to get into. Uh, these, are very, these are very welcoming communities. It is very easy to get started, and there's a sliding scale of things you have to do. You can do to work in that and bring, and bring a benefit. You don't have to necessarily do coding work, you don't have to necessarily do packaging work, even just working, even working on something like documentation is incredibly valuable and something that would be welcomed. The main point where the CentOS community gathers is the CentOS mailing list, which is CentOS Debel on CentOS.org. That's what you would like, want to subscribe if you want to follow what's going on there. Uh, most of the, the, the mailing list is mostly for async discussions, but most of the, I would say, actual work for CentOS tends to happen in meetings um, meetings, although they often either IRC meetings or the occasional video meeting, these are all open. Uh, even meetings for like six you are not a part of, they're all open to the public. You can join them. You're welcome to introduce yourself or just listen in if you would like. You're in particular welcome to join our meetings that we do for Hyperscale. Uh, we have IRC meetings uh, every two weeks and we have a monthly video meeting that's more of a social gathering so that people can see each other face to face. Um, also, if you, there are a lot of SIGs, not just hyperscale. Um, so if any of these work sounds interesting, you should browse the list and see if there's anything there that strikes your fancy that you maybe want to contribute to and help. Um, and then, of course, you, you, can, you can and should file bugs if you find them. You can maintain packages in Appel or in Fedora. Fedora has excellent documentation on how to get started and contribute. Uh, you, you can start from that Fedora Magazine article, which I think is a great entry point. Um, I, myself, and my colleagues have given several talks over the years on this subject and related. We've tried tracking them on, that, on the link at the end of the slide. Uh, so if any of these sound interesting or if you wanted more details on specific things like systemd, uh, I'd encourage you to check that out. Finally, if any of you happens to be in Boston in two weeks, uh, we will be there. Uh, there are going to be several events at Boston University between August 16th and 20th. Uh, there is a hyperscale meetup on August 16th where a number of us will be in a conference room somewhere um, talking about hyperscale, 
seeing if we can drive things forward and probably getting some work done. On the next day, there is a CentOS dojo. Uh, most of, mm, if you're involved in the CentOS community, dojos are smaller scale conferences where folks present the work they've been doing. The past few dojos have all been online because COVID, obviously, uh, but this one is in person. So it's a great opportunity to meet people face to face and see them again after a few years. And then there is DevConf, um, which is a great conference that is uh, sponsored by Red Hat. Uh, that uh, will also have a lot of talks relevant to the Fedora and CentOS and Red Hat ecosystem. That's also at Boston University. That link is a link and the QR code is a link to the um, latest CentOS newsletter that has references to all of these things where you can find where you can sign up. All of these events are free, to be clear. There's nothing to pay. Um, you just have to like, get yourself to Boston somehow. That's all I have. I will be happy to take any questions if there's any time left.